So, Map and Beyond. 21 years ago, uh, Lorraine Rackison and I presided over a unique meeting in Banff, Canada. And it began a very interesting process, which continues today, and um, for which there has been no formal structure up until now. I'd like to tell you that um, in the last week, it has been clear that there are no, now no barriers to our forming a Swiss foundation to be the uh, future structure for this process. And so you're, you're exactly at, at quite an important moment in this process. The BAMP schema was first developed by a group of pathologists, nephrologists, and transplant surgeons at a meeting in BAMP, Canada in August 1991, and it has continued then over the next uh, 21 years and has become the worldwide standard for interpretation of transplant biopsies. What is the BAMF process? It's a moderated, self-organizing group to define and standardize organ allograft biopsy interpretation. The aim is to promote international uniformity in reporting of allograft pathology, which is necessary for research, clinical trials, and standardized patient management. It's an international and interdisciplinary process with meetings every two years. We believe all the stakeholders are represented. We have re represented at the meeting regulatory agencies, uh, pharma, um, the immune tolerance network. Every conceivable stakeholder that you, you can imagine is um, represented at our meetings. There is a mini review coming out this year in uh, Kidney International by uh, myself and Lorraine Rackison. The BAMF classification revisited. And this talk uh, today contains many of the same components as you will find in that article. So why do we need something like the BAMF classification? It, it's, it's really quite surprising that in 1990, the following two stark facts were present for the world of transplantation, that most people interpreting transplant biopsies had no flesh and blood mentor to teach them how to do that, they had a boss who said, go to the books and learn how to do this. <laughs> and all the books were wrong. They were seriously wrong, not just wrong in a minor way, but for instance, they said that if an arteritis is present in the kidney, give up. You can't treat that. Give up on that kidney if an arteritis is present. And today we know that arteritis is the best sign we have for a treatable, reversible rejection uh, reaction. So it became imperative to uh, correct this and to standardize interpretation. So it began then in 1991 when uh, Subsequent publication in Kidney International in 1993 began in the kidney, was extended then to all solid organs. It stands in interesting relationship with the heart transplant classification, which preceded it, and we thought we were following that model, but in fact our model is entirely different. The heart classification initial paper in 1990 had only pathologist authors. No clinicians, no surgeons, no scientists, 
Whereas we have, from the beginning, had, a, had all stakeholders represented in the decision making and in the papers. And in recent years, the Banff meetings have had a strong uh, influence over changes in the heart uh, classification. So we believed we were copying them in the beginning, but in a structural and political sense, we were not. The classification uses a semi-quantitative zero to three plus scoring and diagnostic categories. These are the categories. It's intended that the classification will not complicate the situation, but simply organizes the thinking that the pathologist would already be doing we found a very entertaining article from Reykjavik, Iceland, saying a complex surgical pathology case should take the pathologist 29 minutes on, on average. So we said if it was 29 minutes before the classification, it should be 25, 29 minutes afterwards. We, we, we should not be lengthening the amount of time it takes to read the slides. These are the lesion scores. We're probably at the limit of the complexity of lesion scores. I, I don't think we'll end up with more scores than this. We could modify some of these, but um, once again, it's, it's, it's intended to be a practical uh, classification, one that would uh, result in uh, timely reporting, where it wouldn't take forever to read the biopsies. I've also been part of the uh, genomics um, component of looking at the future of the BAMF classification. So in a sense, I've had one foot in the genomics future and the other foot in a very traditional <laughs> Uh, set of pathology techniques when we first described the BAMF classification. The most advanced technology in it was the PAS stain, which was described in 1954. So it was originally based in the high technology of 1954, but uh, increasingly we, we are looking into a high tech future. We believe that the meetings and the classification and the consensus pr process will go on forever. And uh, we uh, believe that as the field changes, we will change with it. So we have no fixed ideas over such things as whether we will always be transplanting organs or whether someday we will sim simply be growing them from stem cells that would still need to be uh, uh, diagnostic procedures even at that point. So these are some of the milestones. Um, the first conference was in 91. We completely integrated the scoring with the CADI system in 95 with this NIH CCTT classification in 97. We um, have had a genomics focus since 2003. And um, we gradually learned that we had taken over the word BAMF. There are many people in transplantation who have no idea that BAMF is a town. They think BAMF is a medical acronym. And therefore, we thought, well, if that has happened, we can have the meeting wherever we want. So we, 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 we began um, holding the meetings very far from any town named Banff. In 2007, we held the meeting in La Coruña, Spain. And in um, 2011, we were in Paris. In 2013, we will be in uh, Brazil. Just to continue that, in 2015 we will be in Canada, 2017 we will believe we will be in uh, Barcelona, and um, we're entertaining suggestions for 2019 and 2021. We do think ahead in these matters. 
There have been a lot of articles, a very large number of articles that refer directly to the classification and this tendency for articles that directly cite the Banff classification and the Banff process appears to be continuing and increasing. And most of the articles are in high quality journals with high impact factors. The Banff meeting reports and the main meeting papers have been cited more than 4,300 times in the literature. We have had citation classics. And one can imagine that the kind of standardization we have applied to the transplant biopsy sitting in isolation is not of great value to the transplant community if we don't also standardize other things like tissue typing, uh, immunosuppression, and uh, so on, uh, imaging. The classification is in use in all in international clinical trials by the FDA and other regulatory agencies. It's part of mandatory evaluation for new drug approvals. In recent years, we have developed working groups which address unmet needs in a specific focused way. Things such as what does it mean when you have an arteritis but the biopsy is otherwise normal, so-called isolated V. Um, what about C4D negative antibody mediated rejection? There are many other specific questions like that where we have a working group that works on them for a period of maybe four to six years until we solve that particular problem and then we go on to other things. Um, but these working groups are a very important functioning part of the Banff uh, consensus process. We also had one uh, chaired by me on the history and impact of the BAMF process. It not only looks at the past, it also looks at the future. And speaking of the future, you know, I, I don't know if you know what Turing test is or who Turing was, but something quite exciting happened uh, three days ago in that there, we are now in the hundredth year of, uh, after Turing's birth. The Turing test is when machines are able to trick human beings into thinking that they are human beings, where you can no longer tell the in intellectual input from a machine from that of a human being. And in the uh, gaming field, the Turing test was passed on September uh, 26th, which is approximately 100 years after Turing was born. So it's a very exciting uh, time this week in, in terms of uh, the future of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we're just as interested in that sort of thing as we are in the past history of uh, the processes here. Some of the other questions, C4D negative and antibody mediated rejection. How do we define that? What does it mean? And um, the other thing I, I would point out to you is we have never used professional facilitators. In the beginning I facilitated all the consensus discussion. We broadened that to have other uh, physician leaders doing that. But we have always had the discussions run by somebody who understood the subject. Those of you who have been part of other visioning uh, circumstances, very often they bring in somebody who is an expert on consensus generation who knows nothing about the subject that you're generating consensus on. And that is thought to be the way that one generates uh, consensus. We have never done that. We've always used a physician 
facilitators who, who knew the subject that they were facilitating. As many of you know, I teach a unique course on technology and the future of medicine. It talks about the technological singularity, the time when machines will be smarter than we are and control the agenda of the world. That's predicted to occur in 2045. And the young people in this audience today will be alive then, so this is something relevant to you. And um, so I have been quite insistent on incorporating these ideas about the future into our plans for uh, where uh, transplantation pathology and the BAMF classification is, is going. You, you may be interested that the country of uh, Brazil is quite unique in that in the Constitution and uh, the government, they have incorporated this idea of futurism and, and looking toward the future, which is a part of uh, official policy there, and that's where our next meeting is in September 2013. Now, this is sort of a turning point in the talk. Up until now, this talk has been very much like all the other talks I've given on the Banff classification, but now it's different because as of this past week, we can now say that we are changing to have a definite structure that will gird, that will support this process in, in the future. We're forming a Swiss foundation which is similar to, uh, for instance, the Roche Organ Transplant Research Foundation, which is also a Swiss foundation. This will make it easier for us to fundraise. It will make it easier for us to enter into formal relationships with other organizations. In the past, we have had no organization ourselves. We've just had the benign guiding hand of Dr. Solez and Rackison, which is not much of a, a substantive entity. And so this will change things for us quite a bit. And I'm going to now tell you a bit about this plan for the Banff Foundation. This is the proposed structure for it. We'll have a board of trustees of six to nine people with myself as chair and Michael Mangle as the second secretary treasurer. We've identified seven of the members. The other two are, are to be named. There will also be an organ steering uh, committee with a chair, scientific program uh, committee, the BAMF working groups that I told you about, and then each time that we're planning a local conference, there'll be a local conference chair. The objective of the Banff Foundation is to lead development and dissemination of the international Banff classification of allograft pathology to facilitate multidisciplinary collaborative research to enhance its scientific basis, the clinical utility to improve the care of transplant patients. The scope of the foundation is to facilitate knowledge generation and translation and transplant pathology, the ultimate aim to improve patient outcome. Maintaining the BAMP spirit of multinational, multidisciplinary consensus group fundraising, guidance and financial support for the working group activities and for the BAMP meetings themselves. The board of directors will be responsible for annual reports and all the usual things that boards of directors do. I think if I were to read the entire slide to you, you might find it a bit tedious, but we, we um, will serve for a three-year term renewable once, um, which means six years after we start, we should have a whole new board. So. There, there is, are lots of provisions for um, incorporating young people into this. As you might imagine, uh, with my strong focus on the future, uh, my, my thought is that one needs to have young people importantly uh, involved, and that will certainly happen the way this is set up. 
And the flow of handling of funds will eventually all be through this foundation. So we'll have transparency and oversight and accountability and many of the things that would make it much more satisfying uh, for uh, organizations providing us with funds to see that kind of uh, uh, accountability. Scientific Program Committee will be appointed by the Board of Directors. It will have a term of membership of four years. We've always planned a great deal in the future, and, and I, I think that has served us very well. The meeting we just had in Paris had been planned over a six to eight year period and was a very high quality. I, I think we should keep on having that kind of long forward look. The organ steering uh, committees engage pathologists, clinicians, uh, researchers from the major geographical regions, uh, help with fundraising and organization of the organ specific sessions of the meeting. Uh, the leadership is appointed by the board of directors, otherwise it's self-organized. So you know, in the, in the initial meetings, we were in this small building you see there on the right, which is the Trans-Canada Pipeline uh, Pavilion, in a room that holds 30 or so people. And it's a very rural setting. We had mule deer poking their head in the, in the doorway. That doesn't happen any longer. We've gotten a bit bigger, more organized. I think you, you can see that we've come a long way. Uh, we're very proud of our beginnings and of our 21 year history, but we plan much longer than a 21 year future. And we would welcome any, any ideas you may have um, about ways in, in which we could uh, improve this in the long run. So that, that's the last slide. This, this is a much better talk than that previous file, which was a talk from about uh, six years ago. <laughs> I, I, I um, am very pleased to have had the opportunity to tell you about this, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My excellent lecture, uh, we are very fortunate today to listen back and beyond that to the horse's mouth. Now you must be knowing and we must thank Dr. G. Suresh. He had made whole nephrology work as one home through cyber nephrology. You can put your question, any question, you can get a answer which you will not find even in books or even in journals. Yeah. Thank you for your excellent lecture. Thank you. I, I, I would like to say, say something. I, I often have this happen, pe people praising me about my online uh, activities. For a very long time, people who participate in them believe those activities are superior to what happens in journals and, ordin and that kind of uh, organized scientific discourse. And of course, they are absolutely wrong. It, it, it's, it's enjoyable, it's rewarding, it's you know, immediate, you can get an answer right away, and, and it's sometimes very helpful from that point of view. But if you take any question that we've considered over the past you know, quarter century in that way, and look at the details compared to any published paper in any reputable journal, the published paper is always superior. So it, it, it's, it's fascinating to me two things. First of all, people keep saying that the online discussion is better than published papers. They're wrong about that. And they continue to say that the Banff meetings are the best meetings they've ever been to. They're also wrong about that. How could they possibly be true? We don't have the resources. We don't have the scope. 
But what it means is somehow from a psychological point of view, we have satisfied people in a way that, that maybe some of these other venues did not. Um, I spoke yesterday about this fact that each of us as a human being has this you know, ability to feel sort of an uh, empathetic friendship toward 140 other people and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so when, when you go to a meeting that's about that size, as we are uh, today, we are in this room 140 or, or less, you can look at each person and feel that you can care about them. You feel what they feel and, 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 and so on. At a larger meeting, you may find quality things that, that occur that could never occur at a meeting uh, that's as tiny as this and the meetings that we run. But there, there are other things in terms of personal in interactions that happen at a meeting of 140 people or less that's very, very uh, valuable. And I, I think that's why people tell us that the Banff meetings are the best meetings, even though they obviously are not the best meetings. Thank you, Professor Tolley. Professor, you are organizing this Banff meeting outside this Banff nowadays you know I predict uh, uh, I don't know if it will be India but we continue to get proposals from uh, Asia and and the Indian uh, subcontinent and I bet that in 2019 or 2021 it, it'll, it'll be somewhere close to here either here or somewhere close to here um, and and that will be very exciting I, I, I welcome that I think we, we've tried to make it practical but fair so for instance in the in the beginning one of the reasons we began meeting in Europe is that that, that for the first few meetings, the people in Europe were spending a lot of money coming to the meeting. That's one of the other things that you may not realize. Most of the speakers are not paid or uh, subsidized. They're paying their own way. It's a most unusual meeting from that point of view. It means that we could run it with you know, a budget of maybe a tenth, what, what, what you would or ordinarily spend on such a meeting. People are so strongly motivated to be there that most people are self-paying, even most of the people speaking. And so the people we end up paying for are young people, people from poorer uh, countries. And it's very exciting to think of a meeting that consistently over this period of time has been like that. Uh, you know, without paying honoraria, with, with, with many people from far-flung places paying, paying their own airfare and so on. Um, so it would be feasible to have it here. I just can't guarantee that, that but I mean, someplace like this, we, I, I, I see that coming. The world is shrinking and why not? Uh, yes. Any other? Questions? Thank you. Thank you very much.